lots and lots of data sources. But if you are dealing with really complex problems, you simply cannot use these approaches. In that case, we have to use computers that actually can learn from data. You cannot afford to have a computer to learn something like a human class, like 20 years. You want to accelerate that process. And this is what ML at its core is. It's actually learning from data or identifying patterns in the data. For example, you can give ML algorithms, say, all the Wikipedia articles and just ingest them. Once you did that, you can do math with words, which is pretty amazing. So you can take things like king minus man plus woman equals queen. <laughs> so those things are possible. ML actually pushes the boundaries of what we think is unstructured data. Because sometimes we look at the videos and I always see its images, but that's data, that you can look at that data and you can count cars, you can figure out the speed of those cars, or the type of those cars, you can look at text, and there are, there are lots of recent advances in natural language processing that allow you to look at that text and figure out what organizations you are talking about. Are you talking about that in positive terms or negative terms? And actually, these algorithms, like a couple of years ago, Microsoft published a paper saying that the accuracy of speech to text translation is higher than human accuracy. The accuracy of some of those object classification and computer vision algorithms is higher than the human accuracy. You can give it, you can give the algorithm lots of images and ask them to classify them. And some of them are super tricky. And the computer does a better job. <laughs> As a matter of fact, what I did with my daughter, I built my own test of my own computer with a GPU because I'm really passionate about this stuff. And the first thing I did, she, she loves cats. <coughs> So the first thing I did is like, okay, let me train an algorithm to identify different breeds of cat. And I cannot tell them, some of them are really similar. And I said, okay, let's see if you beat the algorithm. She beat it but by a little bit, but because I let her win. <laughs> I can train this all now, and she knows her cats. <laughs> so, what you accomplish with ML, I mean, a lot of the stuff may sound like buzzwords, but you can do some really amazing things with ML. And I'm going to show you, of course, the end, actually, stuff I did. Okay. So in order to make this happen, we have to, uh, we have to find a way to wrestle with the data we have today, make sense of it. This number, 12%, most companies only analyze 12% of their data that they have. It's probably real life, more like 8%. And if you're in a really large company that generates a lot, a lot of data like banks and so on, that can drop down into the 5% range. Of that, the data that we have, a massive amount of it is what we call unstructured data. Images, PDF files, uh, you know, freeform text files, um, crash reports that come from the highway patrol that are handwritten copies of PDFs. Um, all of this data is, is, is going to be our journey over the next few years to create structure around the data, use tools to get it into the event streaming platform, make it available so that we can do something cool with it, right? And then we need you guys to train it. These, the, the machine learning needs a thing that's called the truth, the base truth. Well, it's going to require all of us to train the system as to what, what is the base truth? What is a Siamese cat and, you know, versus a tabby? You know, and, and that, that is a lot of work, but it yields massive returns. So our jobs will change. You know, you know, we'll go from being data wranglers and data, and data ingestion people and, and doing our normal jobs, but also trying to morph to this new world 
but then we become the purveyors of truth. <laughs> so it's going to be a very interesting journey that machine learning will take us down. So, what is the difference between ML and traditional software? So typically, as programmers, what we do, we write code. And in this code, we, we have specific rules, usually. Everything is very deterministic. And that works well for simple problems. But what if the problem is so complex, you cannot write rules? How do you write rules for code to, say, recognize cars versus humans versus cats versus dogs? If people try to do that, and they fail. They tried to do that for many years. They failed. So now there are new algorithms, like things like deep learning, that do that in a really seamless way. That was more fascinating. You can train an algorithm, for example, to recognize humans and cars, and you can use most of the stuff you, you train and use that to recognize other things, like cats and dogs. It's called transfer learning. So you can use algorithms trained by Google. So when I, I'll show you some demo towards the end, but what I'm using, I don't have the resources to train these complex algorithms. I'm using what Google did on their huge data centers and train this for weeks to, to, to customize the solution to what I need to do. When you look at ML, so it's about questions that are really hard to answer. So traditional coding is inputs plus rules creates outputs. ML, you have, you have inputs, outputs, and you derive the rules automatically. This is the, the model, the trained model. This is how an ML algorithm works fundamental. Essentially, it's kind of the same way we work as humans. I, as kids, when we try to learn stuff, what happens? You, you take some action, and either you get the reward or you get punished. Right? There is a feedback mechanism. This is essentially how a lot of these ML algorithms work. There is a thing called the cost function, and all these fancy algorithms, what they try to do is they get penalized if they get wrong, and they get rewarded if they get right. All they try, they try to do mathematically is minimizing this cost function, trying to, to minimize the penalty. And that's all there is to it. At some point. Right. Well, things in practice are more complex than that. In the, in, the beginning, in the beginning, we try to put guardrails around its guessing. We say, well, don't guess this stuff over here or this stuff. Keep your guesses within this, this area of, of uh, data sets and, and area of outcomes. And that's the training that we try to do. And, and the guessing derives the rule sets out of it. So, how do we do this in practice? Right. We, we take all the data huh, and we throw it at Watson and we get the answers, right? Well, it doesn't work that way. Like, it never works that way. <coughs> there is a lot of work you have to do to make this happen. So, there are very mundane tasks you actually have to do. You, you, in my experience, you Almost never you can take some data and just throw it on an ML algorithm. You have to clean up that data, you have to normalize, you have to do all sorts of things until this stuff works. Okay, it's not that easy. There are ML tools that help us normalize data and help us clean data as well. So that you, you, you go into this kind of a stacked relationship of using, going into multiple uses of ML to get you to where you want to go. Right? But in the beginning, it's mostly men. Let's, let's get to a standard data governance, uh, ontological model in our data governance. Let's, let's look at each of our, our legacy data sets 
and create a metadata catalog and metadata model for it. Then let's create a connector and bring it into the event stream. Now we can grab those data any way we want, mix and match them into an ML analysis. Um, when you speak about ML, actually there are totally different types of algorithms. So on one hand, you have things, a type of algorithms called supervised learning. What that means, you give some input and an expected output if you have labeled data. And then you feed new data into this algorithm and you expect it to make a prediction. Supervised algorithms are things like uh, object classification, cat versus dog versus car versus human. Um, there are other types where you can be still supervise, where you can <coughs> predict the continuous value. Why? I've never seen this working in practice, but in theory, you can give stock price data and you can predict the future stock prices. I'm still working on that. Uh, I'm seriously. When he does, you know, he won't show up to work because he'll be a millionaire. But that didn't work so well so far. That's the market. <coughs> The other type of algorithms, you just throw data at the computer and learn to classify. That's the example I gave previously with um, what it treats words as numbers. Actually, it treats words as vectors, to, to be more specific. And then you can use also, you have other types of algorithms where you can do anomaly detection, for example. And those things sound fancy, but some of them are pretty simple. I mean, they seem like predicting a probability for a bridge to fail or something like that. So I know with engines, they, they use this sort of algorithms, and they looked at different features. And each of the feature, each of the signals have the probability of being within some ranges. And what happened if many of the features are outside some ranges, then the probability is very high for, for engine to fail. It sounds complicated. It's not that complicated when you put these things together. It's one of the first classical uses of ML and AI <coughs> in the world, uh, is that GE started doing this for FedEx on all of their aircraft. So they were using it to predict <coughs> maintenance failures. They are using it to look at it, uh, begin to associate uh, certain readings out of the jet with other readings out of the jet motor and getting very, very good at making sure that when an aircraft needed a repair done, they had the, the aircraft on the ground with the right maintenance guide and the right parts and, and tools ready to turn that jet so that their aircraft on ground time went, went to zero down there. It was, it cost, it saved them literally billions of dollars. So it was, that was one of the first classical applications. Are, are ML and AI the same thing, or is there a difference? That's an excellent question. So, artificial intelligence is a broad field. Within artificial intelligence, part of it is ML. So some of the things are ML. People mix them, I know. But there are some of things are ML, others are AI. Within ML, you have another thing called deep learning. It's a specific types of algorithms within this field of ML. And usually when you hear about all these exciting things, like self-driving cars and using ML, most of the times what they mean is actually deep learning, which is a specific type of algorithms. And require, some of them require quite expensive GPUs. <laughs> so. so about 18 months ago, I wrote a paper, and uh, there were about 12 classic ML areas. Now it's 22-ish, you know, and so it's, it's growing. And um, artificial, I mean, we'll probably, as a group, drive into the ML world first until we all become much more educated as a group about ML. And then we might steer off into some AI stuff, but ML's the place you typically start. Actually, it's pretty interesting because like in the 70s, I think, 
eight Iowa's like a superb hot field. And then we had the AI winter. So what happened at that time, I know there were some program languages like Lisp that were created, what's his name, John McCarthy or something? McCarthy is his last name. He created Lisp to, to actually solve artificial intelligence problems. Today, there is a Lisp language closure, which I absolutely love. It's my favorite programming language and super productive. Where we took a lot of these ideas developed from AI. When he developed this programming language, he invented a lot of things like garbage collection and things like that that are used today. So AI, even if it died in the 70s, it helped actually computer science today. And in the 70s, it wasn't actually possible to do what we do today for a few reasons. We didn't have the data. Huh? Now we have significant amounts of data. And it's not just data. So things that help uh, make huge progress in this field are certain types of data set. There is this huge database of classified images created by Stanford called ImageNet. This was critical to being able to make this significant progress in computer vision. Could you give us an example of something that's AI and not ML? Like what, what's, what's an AI but not ML? So you can have some, for example, some rule-based systems that seem like, oh, this is kind of spooky. I'll actually show you an example, a demo. Um, I'll show you a demo towards the end. Okay. So I, actually, I'll tell you what it is about. So Charles, if you attended Charles' presentation about the Tesla update, he showed how his car changes lanes uh, in response to traffic. I wrote an algorithm like that in a simulator, not the real car, that does the exact same thing. But I'm not using ML for that. It, it's kind of spooky. When you look at it, it's like, whoa, this, this thing drives itself. But that is not a map. It's, it's what I call AI. I, I have deterministic things I do to make this thing behave this way. I didn't learn this stuff from data. And you'll see what I mean when I get it. Look, in a lot of cases, in, in ML, you, you, you'll use ML to train uh, a, a, off of a data set a series of rules that come together into an artificial intelligence application that then is stacking all of those events at, in real time uh, it, it, as it's being run. So in his case, if the car is running down the road, it's saying, okay, that's the side of the road, there's a car in front of me, there's this, I can see that sign, I got this, this, and it's pulling in so much data at the same time that an artificial intelligence application is really the only thing that has the amount of um, mathematics built in rule sets, near some rule sets, not hard, fast rule sets, where it, it's, it's weighing the outcomes, right? It's saying, well, it's about 92% probable that that was a stop sign, I think I'll stop, right? You know? <laughs> but it's doing probabilities the whole time. It's, nothing's hard and fast, and that's the thing that you gotta get your head around with all of this in ML and AI. Very rarely will you see anything in, above the mid-80s in probability. So we've got to understand we're going to, we're living in the real world now where there is gray, you know, and then the same thing goes with data. So yeah, everything in ML is a probability, it's a prediction, but it's never, almost never, hundred percent. Okay. So anyway, so the, when you do ML, as I said, you have to do a lot of dirty work. Although it sounds super cool, you will spend a lot of the time on data prep and all this stuff. Then. You have to figure out what algorithms work, what type of algorithms are you going to use, and then you have to build your model. And that, although may sound easy, sometimes it's not. I mean, you have to do a lot of trial and error. What I really find fascinating, and one of the reasons I put so much time into ML, because it pushes my boundaries. I, I learned how to write decent code. When I start doing ML, it's actually a different way of thinking. All the good practices I learned, like test your code, like you cannot do that with ML. 
Okay, you have to think really different. Okay, it's, it's, it's a discovery process. And even when you, when you have your model, you think you have it, then you have to figure out what parameters to use for it. There are hyperparameters you have to tune for a model to perform well. So anyway, you cannot just throw data at the model and cross your fingers. You have to check, well, is this model actually behaving the way it should with new data? Is it making the right predictions? Or it just memorized all the data I gave it? Because if it, if it is doing a really good job with the data I saw before, and a really bad job with new data, it, it's, uh, it means it's overfitting. If it actually you gave it too many parameters, it memorized everything, so not good <laughs> in practice. Yeah, too good of an answer should always make you a little suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And there are techniques you, you can use to, to avoid, to, to prevent that from happening. And some of them are actually quite fascinating. Uh, they invented some of these techniques in the context of deep learning. What essentially is, is called a uh, dropout. So essentially, you have your model, and all of a sudden, you shut down randomly 50% of the nodes in there. And actually, that makes this model learn better because you are building redundancy into the system. It says, well, even if this thing is dead, there are other things that have to reach the same result following different paths. And all these techniques, so these things weren't possible back in the 70s. All these advances, so there are advances in the algorithms that happened very fairly recently. There are, we simply didn't have the same compute power back in the 70s. We didn't have the label data sets. We didn't have the data sources. So, um, I hope this is not going to be another ML winter, but it doesn't seem like it, because we can solve actual problems with, with ML. We had 300 volume models in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those were awesome. Dial up. Yay. <laughs> so, um, once you train the model, you like that model right, back in your life? What, what do you do? You use it to actually make predictions in, in real life, Try right? to give it the new inputs, you use the model and it makes the predictions. Right, you can classify or all sorts of things. Let's give you an example. Um, the uh, bunch of master students at Ohio State looked at the last three years of crash data in, in, in Ohio, last three recorded years, so four quarter last year, and all of the weather data on top of it predicted last winter's crash rating, and they were 82% correct as to where the crashes were going to be, what the rate was going to be, and so on. So that, that really applies directly to us. We know it can work. Now if we get that in real time, we're really ahead of the game. So, when, where can we apply some of this stuff? Well, we can apply some of these ML techniques in traffic management. As I said, you can take image data from cameras and do traffic counts, traffic speeds, how congested the road is, maybe even identify traffic crashes. I'm not saying it is easy, because no, it's not. It's a lot of work, but it is possible. But it also makes it easier in the TMC for a person to not have to be that supercomputer seeing this just hordes of data coming down and trying to make a great split-second decision. I just said it's not easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's easy for the recipients of yeah. the data. Building that is actually not easy. Uh, uh, another thing is self-driving cars. You, you can use a lot of ML. I'm going to show you for self-driving cars. Um, you can use ML for street object detection and classification. Some of these things can happen in real time. There will come a time when the, these cars that are running around the roads with all these sensors will, will open up and feed that pipe back to us. And we can use that pipe to properly tag everything that that car is seeing. So now instead of only having the road center line and curb cuts, we can have everything tagged. We can see the sidewalk, you know everything going down the sidewalk. We need to be prepared to be able to take that data and make great use of it. 
something like that would help us get blind people down sidewalks with, with a, you know, highly accurate GPS control. There's some really cool stuff we can do when we get there. Yeah. The other thing I, I talked about is uh, predicting failure. I mean, it, it will depend on the kind of data we ingest, so I don't know if that's even possible with the data we have, <coughs> but I know there are multiple instances where actually they use this type of algorithms for predicting failure. We have hordes of data on the roads that we drive over and scan. Well, we need to, to take that and do a historical ML analysis on it and see, can we correlate that data to our, to our maintenance data and look at, oh, hey, are our rules of thumb on, on degradation models correct? Or shall, shall we look at it a different way? And I know another use case for uh, this kind of stuff is Andrew Ng, he's one of the pioneers in deep learning and he used to be a professor at Stanford. One of his startups, they, they do anomaly detection on electronics. So this used to be like a very tedious process requiring humans to see if there are defects. Now they train ML to, to identify that. Also in medicine, it's like you can give uh, like x-ray pictures to, to an ML algorithm and they showed that the accuracy of the ML algorithm <coughs> is higher than human accuracy. That's pretty impressive stuff. He, um, Andrew has an introductory course on machine learning on Coursera, C-O-U-S-E-R-A. It's a, it's a training, online training site and that about what ML can and can't do. It's a really good introduction to machine learning. And uh, it's a great class and he, he teaches it. It's good. And actually, another use case is actually reviewing contracts and uh, legal documents. Mm -hmm. I haven't worked directly with this type of algorithms, but I know there are companies built around that where pretty much they can <coughs> replace legal stuff for fairly mundane tasks. And I saw it, algorithm competing against a fairly well-paid attorney, and the algorithm did a better job, identified some issues in contracts that the human couldn't, and when the algorithm pointed to them, it's like, yeah, the algorithm is right. So it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, we'll put lawyers out of business. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, I don't know, they, they still need humans, but... Uh, so how can we get there? First, it's like start actually getting the data and start experimenting with it. What is possible and what is not? A, lo a lot of this is research. Okay, I, I'm not going to promise here I'm going to solve a problem before I actually solve it. I, I know it is possible to solve it, but also I know it can take a lot of work. Well, collectively, so, we've got to become a research organization. If you're going to play, if you're going to come along with this whole ML thing, you got to. We have to yeah. take the mentality that we'll, we'll have failures. And we'll, so, then we'll have great successes, but you gotta be okay with the failures. So I'm gonna show you some of the projects I've worked on that actually I'll start with a project that is AI and is not that bad. Okay. So I I did a lot of projects as part of this self-driving cost. So, the screen. Oh, I think it. You got your modem? Yeah. Maybe it can be sitting there. The computer is working against it. The machine is learning. <laughs> <laughs> Did you forget to tell them Did you forget to add your, your goal function that it shouldn't be Skynet? <laughs> <laughs> Ethics and AI stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, I also have an HDMI cable. I can use 
by just train and put it on something different that I never saw before. And here is how it does. Here is what it does. So in this case, I hope you agree this looks pretty different from the previous one. And it knows how to drive. This is actually deep learning. So that's on that's on the actual vehicle itself. We're we're responsible for designing and building all the roads. The one thing that could happen in this model right away that happens every day in Ohio is a deer could jump right out in front of that <laughs> car, right? So what do we do to keep that from happening? So now as we begin to instrument on our roads and put cameras in there, we train our models, infrared only and, and video sensor fused sensors to look for deer to determine, a, determine the deer's path, give an area that the deer is likely to go in, and then send warnings to every auto, uh, connected vehicle that might. So Brian, I'm not going to promise that if you do it, I'm watching. <laughs> <laughs> you see, this is where we're going, so, um, right? Um, the other thing, I didn't do this. I didn't do the next thing I'm going to show you through deep learning, but I know it can be done. I use computer vision techniques, but another thing you can do with deep learning, and actually, is this kind of stuff. You see, I presented video images, and it detects where the lanes on the road are. That's not too bad. And there are some challenges places here where the line disappears or it's not clear or you have shade and you can pitch it like here it, and it recovers and so I'm not saying you put it in your car it needs extra work this is a fair, but this is a fairly high resolution image one of the things I want you guys to understand is you don't have to have a super high resolution image to be able to do some machine learning they can be really crappy cameras and you can still get usable data, like how fast are these dots that I can see going across, how fast are they going across? You so, I, actually, I, I, for some of these, I had to do that because I was doing all this on my laptop, and it had the GPU, but it wasn't powerful enough. At some point, I got tired of it, and I built my own GPU stuff. So, this is actually trained with, on the proper test. So here I'm identifying actually both cars and people. I'm doing object detection in real time for cars and people. You'll see some pedestrians crossing at some point. And I can also train it to actually identify the red line. I did that for some other stuff. So all this stuff is possible. You see people in 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 group. So how does this relate to other? But pretty simple. I learned last week that we get all the camera data, we stream all the camera data from hundreds of cameras, and we save that internally. And that streaming happens pretty much in real time. I didn't know that. I thought we just sent metadata. The same day, I was in a meeting with Watson, like your podcast, I think, us. And John Allen said, well, we have all this data, and we have like a few smart cameras, and then we have lots of dumb cameras that we have to replace over time. And when she said that, I realized something. It's like, we have all the data we need. Actually, I can turn dumb cameras into, cam into, into cameras that are smarter than the smart camera. And it's pretty simple. Because the smart cameras, what they do, yes, they do computing on the edge. But their power is limited. Whatever you can do on a Raspberry Pi, pretty much that's what they do. They use very basic algorithms that fail a lot of times. And actually, I didn't trust them myself. I don't. They use them. And they make claims, but whatever. So you can do, you can use way more advanced algorithms on premise using actual GPU <coughs> and do things that are actually not possible on the edge. 
even with that video. It's, we can experiment with that, but we can use that data and start with a few cameras and a few GPUs and actually start doing traffic counts, uh, traffic flow analysis and stuff like that. So our first that is possible. It's our first ML red line idea, right? Well, well we, we don't see. have to buy all these expensive cameras. We, we, right? have, we, we have, have that one means one of the folks with money to, to buy this. It's a graphics product. processing unit. It, it actually, um, the difference between a, a CPU and a GPU is the type of math it does. And, and what we found is that GPUs do beautifully in ML training. So, so oh, and blockchain, blockchain. Yeah. <laughs> And the other thing is I, I've seen, um, I was talking with somebody from Graphic Corporation, and they had a camera feed. And I know they also have data from another source, from a traffic signal control. You can put the two, two data sources together to figure out if a car went on a red, right? Otherwise, you cannot because you have it. So my point is, here I feel like kind of like a kid in the candy store. Like there are all these really cool data sets, real-time data sets, who are sitting on a board line pretty fast. I mean, we have huge opportunities to actually do real research. So all the problems will be taken out. <coughs> but we have an opportunity to do really transformational things. And if you have ideas how to put this data together, even if it, if it seems crazy, just talk to us. Maybe there is something to it. That, that's really our big ask, is that hopefully this sparks some ideas of what machine learning might do, and what we might be able to do with it. Let's make a list of wild ideas, and let's start distilling it down and saying, well, you know, what data do we need to get there to prove, to test it, to, to, to go into the trial period. And, it's the uh, traffic signal timing in downtown Gehenna. Because it's not a nightmare to drive through there. I, I was on Smart Columbus we can't program. Fix I can tell you, it's a political problem, not a technical problem. Okay. And yeah. I, it's a political problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's an easy thing. I know when I had to slow the behavior of running to teach the car to drive itself in that circuit. When I was given the problem, like, is that even possible? How, where do I even start? I mean, some problems seem impossible, but I think some type of problems you can solve. But on the, on the signaling side, a vast majority of the signals in, in the ODOT owns are driving towards being connected signals. So they'll at least be sending their signal phase and timing out. The, you know, any the, they'll have the ability to communicate with us. We'll be in a better position to prove corridor efficiencies by putting in in you know ML and AI models like uh, Carnegie Mellon's got a really really great one. We just started there and had a series of connected lights and we had enough tertiary sensing of the flows in and the flows out that we could use. We could prove to the rest of the state it works. Right? We can we get to be in, in the, the ones that get to prove to everybody else this stuff is worthwhile. And uh, it'll save money, save lives. It's just, there's a whole lot of upside. Like you said, we feel like kids in a candy store. But we need you guys, your brains, your experience, your knowledge of the infrastructure, your knowledge of how the data is. I need to know how did we take the data in the first place? How accurate was that method of taking the data? And what is, how did it get to be what it is today? If we know that lineage, we can do so much more at the wrangling and getting the data in. And I also need to know how you do business because it all overlaps. All of it. So that's all we have. So we have a request for a settlement, uh, no passing settlement project um, that we're going to build requirements on uh, starting in 2020. However, um, we have a vendor who's offered a solution uh, that we currently have and it's very expensive. What you showed there would allow us to capture off of our current uh, photo wall the center line striping, the auxiliary striping, the edge line striping, and get distances from that. I think so. So. Because 
I'll be seeing you in a minute. <laughs> 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 I've been there, man. So any more ideas like that? Couples. I have a question. Are there like uh, ML applications that can modify themselves as they learn like modify their written algorithms? Well, there is a thing called auto ML. And essentially what, what you can do, and it depends exactly on the type of algorithms. So Google has this meta algorithm that finds a model in like across many models, the one that works best. But can it actually create models out of smaller components? You actually use like very extensive compute power to do that. That's one thing. The other, maybe you've heard the term of auto ML. You just throw stuff at it and figures it out. So essentially what that does, and I usually that's not deep learning, that's traditional ML. And actually what happens, you have this thing that trains all these models in parallel and keeps going through this whole model space and tries, okay, I'm gonna try decision space, I'm gonna try classification, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it just tries, okay, what is better, what is better, what is better. So there are services for simpler algorithms called AutoML, and there are a few companies doing that, like Data Robot, for example. Then there is stuff Google has, and I'm not gonna get into that because it takes like weeks to train or months to train across many TPUs, they build their own hard hardware. Tens of processing units. So, but there is nothing that just kind of clones itself and like figures out. There are techniques that actually, as you use this thing in production, it kind of retrains itself if you give it some feedback, if that's what you mean. Okay. So yes, are the ones that there are. Because, for example, in the retail industry, fashion changes all the time. Right, like whatever people prefer this year is going to be different from next year. So you may have predictive algorithms, and those preferences change over time. Yeah. And you have to kind of continuously train the algorithm. Yeah. And it is possible, you kind of, but at the end of the day, you have to have some sort of feedback mechanism. Yeah. Because if you don't have that, yeah, that like that's, it's, it's not gonna that's the source of the truth we need from all of you, right? <laughs> it, um, Right here in Columbus, Data Robot is a little company right here in Columbus. So they're specializing in that type of, of technology on iterative, cyclic, uh, tightening up of the model or continuously checking the model to make sure it's, it's doing what you want it to do. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Can I need to